In this video, I will show you what the different norm functions do and how they are related to one another. Our norm acts as a random number generator that allows you to simulate numbers based on a normal distribution. The density of this distribution can be analyzed with the denorm function. pnorm gives you the cumulative probability distribution based on a certain quantile and qnorm gives you the quantile distribution based on a certain probability. In case this was too fast or not clear, here's an example. The intelligence quotient or IQ is centered around 100 and has a standard deviation of 15. With R norm, I created 200 points that follow this distribution, which is summarized by a box plot. And here the box holds 50% of the points, which fall within a range of 90 to 110. The denorm function shows the density or probability of observing certain values. For example, it is very unlikely to have an IQ of 140 or higher, and the highest probability is at 100. The pnorm function tells you that with an IQ of 125, you are within the top 95.2 percentile. And with the qnorm function, you can ask if you want to be in the top 85%, what IQ do you need? And this would be 116. Let me teach you the R code now so you will be able to use these functions for your own analysis. When you try to run the R norm function without any arguments, you get an error message because n has to be specified. n is the first argument you are supposed to give. So with n equals 1, you get one random number. If you run it again, you get another one and another one. And if you want to get the same random number as me, or you want to write code that simulates the same numbers every time you run it, you can set a seed. And now R norm will give me this number. And every time I set the seed to 1 again, this is the first R norm number that I get. And if you want to simulate 30 R norm values, you just change the number. And if you don't want to get so many decimal numbers, you can set the digits to four within the options function. And now it looks a bit cleaner. And if we sort these values, you notice that they are not completely random, but they land within a certain range. So it hardly reaches minus two or plus two. Roughly half of the values should be within this range of plus minus 0.69. And that's because the numbers follow the normal distribution. And by default in R norm, the mean is set to zero with a standard deviation of one. You can of course change the mean and the standard deviation. For example, here I simulate 50 male heights with a mean of 1.78 meters and a standard deviation of six centimeters. And you can see that it's really rare to get above two meters in height. Now let me just briefly talk about the properties of the normal distribution. By default in R it will produce the red line, which is centered at zero mean with a standard deviation of one. And these values play a role in the formula that calculates the density for various x values. It also contains two constants, pi and e, but the two values that you can change is the mean and the standard deviation. And the standard deviation squared is the variance. So when you change the mean, for example, to minus two, then the peak of the distribution is at minus two. If you decrease the variance or the standard deviation, the distribution gets more narrow. And if you increase it, it gets more wide. With a smaller standard deviation, bigger x values get less and less likely, and most of the values will be closer to the mean. Speaking of the standard deviation, you might already know that regardless of how narrow or wide the distribution is, 68% of all values fall within minus and plus one standard deviation. And the rest of the distribution is almost completely covered within plus or minus three standard deviations. I already showed you the box plot and here the interquartile range, which holds 50% of all values. To get to these, you should memorize that it's roughly two thirds of a standard deviation plus minus the mean that's the interquartile range. And for outliers, there's the rule that once you go one and a half times the interquartile range above the third quartile, every value outside this line is considered to be an outlier. And the whiskers of the box and whisker plot extend to this range, one and a half time above or below the first and the third quartile. Now what happens when you run the R norm function? It will look into the underlying distribution and pick numbers according to the density. So here you can see that many points are within the range of plus and minus one standard deviation around the mean of zero. And the probability to draw a value that's around two standard deviations is less and less likely. And the area under this curve adds up to one or 100%. 
So now let's see if we can recreate the density function of the normal distribution. For this I used the sec function to create a sequence from minus 3 to 3 in steps of 0.1. And in the denorm function this would be x. And then you also have to give it the mean of 0 and the standard deviation of 1 and it spits out these values. And now just to remind you, we created values from minus three to plus three for the red line, which should peak at 0 0.4. And the 0 0.4 is almost reached for value 31, which is this, the center of the mean at zero. But then the density or probability to observe values that are far away from the mean have a really low likelihood. So if we would plot these values for y based on these x values, we would get a chart like this. Let us now move on to the p-norm function, but stay at the body height example. So we still use the mean of 178 centimeters with a standard deviation of 6. And now we can ask, what's the probability of being 180? And you get 63%. And this is a cumulative probability, which means that giving a normal distribution of 178 with a standard deviation of 6, 63% of all values will be 180 or below. And the value that's expected in p-norm is q, which represents a quantile, and we can give it multiple values. How does the probability change for multiple values? And here you can see for this distribution, 0.1% of values fall below 160, 9% of the human males will be 170 or smaller, 178 is exactly the mean, so half of the population will be below that. 180 we already checked, 63% fall below that. If you're 190, then you're taller than almost 98% of all males, and 2 meters puts you into the 99.988 percentile. So this cumulative distribution we just checked, but not for the mean of 0 and standard deviation of 1. You can see that it slowly increases to 50% at the mean, and then for the next values you reach almost 100%. So remember the sec function we used, if we would put that into the p-norm function as q with the default mean and standard deviation, we would have gotten these probabilities slowly accumulating to 50% at the value of 0 again. But maybe here it's more meaningful to choose the certain standard deviations that you might be familiar with. Let's use 0.67, 1, 2, 2.5 and 3. And if you remember 0.67 is roughly the value we had for the interquartile range. So this means you covered almost 75% of the data. One standard deviation or below represents 84%. And then when you get to two standard deviations above the mean, you're at 97 and 2.5 is the 99 percentile. The q-norm function expects a p-value, so a probability, and is the reverse of the p-function. So you can ask if I am want to be in the top 99 percentile for a mean of 178 with a standard deviation of 6, how tall do I have to be? And you get 1 meter and 92 centimeters. And for the example with the IQ, if you want to be in the top 75 percentile with an average IQ of 100 and a standard deviation of 15, you would have to have an IQ of 110. And the p-norm function can be used to calculate ranges as well. So going back to the height example, if you want to figure out what proportion of a population is within range of 190 and 170 centimeters, you would simply subtract the 97% that are below 1.90 with the percentage you get for 170. And this would tell you 88.6% of the population falls within a range of 170 and 190. And going back to the default, if you just want to know what proportion of the normal distribution falls within minus two standard deviations and minus one standard deviation, you get 13.6%. And that's what we saw in this example as well. 13.6% fall within that range. And these kind of calculations can be helpful, for example, if you want to design something for men and you know their height and you want to figure out what proportion would you cover if you design it for people from 1.7 to 1.9 meters, you would get your answer here that you would exclude roughly 11% of the males. And in case you were wondering how I created these charts, here's the R code for that. First I created a data frame with 200 random numbers with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15, and also a value column that runs from 1 to 200, and a box column that has the constant 100 value. 
So this is how it looks, 200 values with random numbers centered around 100. And I also created a polygon data frame with the denorm function for the density chart later that basically goes from 50 to 150 in steps of 0.5 and has from 0 to 0 an attached density that peaks around the value of 100. And then I first added the box plot for the normally distributed data that is centered at the box value of 100 for x and for y has the r variables that were stored in this column. I gave it a constant width of 50 and I made it a bit more transparent, selected colors based on a hex code and then I overlaid that with the geom point geom with the x axis representing the values that run from 1 to 200 and r values again for the y axis. I choose a certain size and made it a bit less transparent but still that you can see some overlap of points and then I erased the x and y axis labels and gave it a title and subtitle with the gg title function. For the density distribution, the data frame has x and y values, x going from 50 to 150 and y having the associated density that you create with the denorm function. Then I do the aesthetics mapping within ggplot and I first add the geom polygon that's based on the polygon data that has x and y values again with increasing y values the moment you come to the 100 peak and for this geom I use the polygon data and the aesthetics mapping and then I add the geom line with a certain size and color and label it again. For the cumulative probability distribution and the p-norm function I first set a constant value for the x-axis of 125 that was the IQ that I want to check how much more intelligent that value is than the values below given a distribution of 115 for standard deviation so the associated probability you get with the p-norm function when you you provide this Q value of 125. For the other Y values, I simulate data from 50 to 150 that you can see on the X axis and it would produce the associated Y axis values. You can turn those into percentages with the scales Y continuous function and a percent label that comes from the scales package. You can also give it set breakpoints at 25%, 75% and the P norm Y value which is at 95.2%. Then I give it a label again and a subtitle and then the geom segment function allows you to draw lines wherever you want. So the first line I draw has a set x value of 125, so that's just happening from here to here, but the y value extends from just below 0 all the way up to the p-norm value, and the second line I draw goes from x40 to the x value 125 that we set up here, and the y values are just held constant, so it's always on this y position of 95.2%, and for line type I use dashed because it's aesthetically a bit more pleasing. So with p-norm we can ask, giving a certain IQ, what probability is there to have this one or below? And with q-norm you flip that around, you can ask if I want to be in the top 85 percentile or quantile, what IQ or higher would I need for that? So here I ask if I want to be in the top 85 percent, what q value do I need? And I calculate that from 0 to 100 percent in steps of 0.005, giving our IQ distribution. And on the x-axis I have these values that run from 0 to 1 with associated y values. And then you simply plot the line that follows that. I use geom segment again to draw these dashed lines. And I use scale y continuous to give it specific breakpoints for the tick of the axis label. And with scale x you can turn it into percentages again. I hope you found the explanations of these various norm functions useful and will use them for your own analysis. See you in the next video here at the Data Digest.